Alrighty folks, welcome to my channel and today we're looking at the ResNet paper, so Deep Residual Learning for Image Recognition, which in 2015 won the uh, ImageNet Detection, Image Localization, and Cocoa Detection and Cocoa Segmentation competition. So it's really impactful paper, especially in 2015 and even till this days, it's really um, set the standards for computer vision tasks. So let's get into it. So in the abstract, uh, they say deep neural networks are more difficult to train. For sure. Is learning better networks as easy as stacking more layers? And no, actually it's harder. And we saw it in VGG when they stack more layers and the accuracy is saturated. And we also saw it in Inception when they had to use the axillary classifiers just to allow the gradients to not vanish. So an obstacle to answering this question was notorious problem of vanishing and exploding gradient. That's exactly what happened especially in Inception. And what they say here is let us consider a shallower architecture and its deeper counterpart that adds more layer onto it. There exists a solution by construction to the deeper model. The added layers are identity mappings and the other layers are copied from the learned shallower model. The existence of this constructed solution indicates that deeper models should produce no higher training error than its shallower counterpart. And what does it mean? So this, this statement is loaded with information and it's actually pretty easy. So we can simply look at four layers network that, that we trained before and we add a eight layers on the top of it. So technically we shouldn't have lower training error than it already is, right? We only can still get the same error or lower than this. So when we get the same error, it's basically identity mapping. So we got the um, f of x equal to x. So it returns the same argument. So we got the same information and the training error or accuracy is the same. But as we know, the degradation problem is actually you can't even learn the identity mapping. It's just getting worse and worse. That's why the accuracy getting worse and training error increase with the layer. And instead of trying to learn this identity mapping by the another layers, we can actually just pass it. And that's what they actually propose in this network. We actually just pass the information before and we just add it. So whatever we learn in this eight layers or in this part, it's basically on the top of the identity. The network doesn't need to learn identity. As you can see, in the worst case scenario, let's say the H is the output and F of X plus X, that's basically the output of these layers. So in the worst case scenario, the F of X can go to the zero, which normally the network does. And we still get the information here. So if you think about it, gradient flow is so much better in this network. And we always learn something. We got the previous information and we learn the new information all the time. We don't need to learn uh, the identity mapping anymore. So that's a really interesting solution. And it's allowed to base go deeper with the networks and also prevent the vanishing gradient. So that's how the ResNet blue block look like. Um, we got two layers and we got the identity summed up with the extracted features from two, these two layers. So they call it a deep residual learning framework. And yeah, this, these connections are called shortcut connection and they just perform basically identity mapping. So they state that our extremely deep residual nets are easy to optimize. And I love this statement and it's actually the summary of the whole paper. So basically our deep residual nets can easily enjoy accuracy gains from greatly increased depth producing results substantially better than the previous networks. Totally true. All right, so I think we got the intuition behind the whole paper and now we can go to the architect. So they present two networks architectures here. They compare it to VGG19. And so they create the plain network. So it's the same convention as VGG. So basically stack more layers on the top of it, on the top of each other. And they actually don't use pooling layers. They just down sample using the stripe too. They also use global average pooling at the end instead of fully connected. And surprisingly, this network has lower complexity than VGG. And it mainly because they used um, smaller feature maps over there. You see if BGG used 512, um, they used 256, 128. What they do here is basically they introduce the shortcut connections 
as we see in a, in a residual block. And they also have this dotted line connection over here. So what it does, as you can see, we get the output of 64 feature maps and we need to add it to 128. So obviously we need to somehow change the dimension to match these shapes. So they consider two options. You can either perform the identity mapping with extra zero entries padded, so they basically pad the uh, input, or you can use a projection shortcut where you use the one-on-one -on -one convolution. So you just increase the number of feature maps. And obviously, as you can see, they use try two here, so to downsample the input. And in order to match the dimension, you need to also use the strike two for projection. I think it all makes sense when we're gonna code it. In the implementation, they actually adopted the batch normalization. I think it was one of the first networks that did it. And they do it right after each convolution and before activation. Empirically, I guess the, it works better when you use it after activation, but let's stick to it in the code with the convention they actually use. They use SGD batch size 256. They actually, because they use batch normalization, they could use the higher learning rate. So as you can see, even on the graphs, they use really high 0 0.1 learning rate. And when it's getting saturated, or basically it's, it's kind of stops learning, they divide it by 10. That's the way you get all these drops on the graph. They don't use actually dropout because of the batch normalization, because batch normalization already introduced some of the noise to the network, so it doesn't require dropout anymore. This is the whole network. So they actually presented also a different configuration. So let me get to... They actually, yeah, they built plane 34, obviously 18, and they also built 50 layers 101, 152, and they change one thing in there. So when we got our residual block in 34, they use 3 on 3, 64, 3 on 3, 64, and they increase the feature maps. While in 50 layers and more, they used the bottleneck block. As you can see, the input is 256 dimension. They create the 64 channel projection and they, they pass it to 3 on 3, 64 channel projection. Then they pass it to 3 on 3 kernel and they do another projection later on and sum it up. And it actually has lower parameters than the, the plane block. So that's why they use it in a more deeper network. So they also describe again the zero padding shortcuts they use, so option A, option B where they when they create the projection shortcuts for increasing dimensions. And they also introduce option C where all shortcuts are projected. What it means is basically every shortcut is a projection. So it involves a one-on-one -on -one convolution. B is slightly better than A and C is marginally better than B because we have more parameters. That's what they attribute to. So yeah, we're gonna actually stick to B and we're gonna implement the bottleneck block in our network and overall it's a good read so if you want to give it a try and i guess with all that information we can go to the call app and implement it all right so first of all we're going to create the conv block so as you recall in a the paper they say that they use batch normalization after each convolution so we can actually create a block where we're going to add convolution and batch normalization at the same time it just saves time to basically not write everything again so yeah, we inherit the NN module, we define init, so we pass the in channels, out channels, kernel size, stripe, and padding. Okay, we need to call super function, and we um, yeah, we create a convolution. So you basically got all this pass it there. And we define batch normalization, which is... And we pass the out channels, because it's after the convolution. So now we define forward function. And we just basically pass the input through convolution and batch normalization. So right, that's the first block. The next one is bottleneck block. So I think that's the main part and the most difficult part of the whole 
implementing it's kind of more advanced comparing to the previous we did like inception or alexnet or whatever so yeah let's call it residual block we're gonna inherit nl module define init function and we're gonna pass here input channels as always and output channels and we're gonna define first I'm going to explain it later on what it means. Yeah, we call super function. If you look at the bottleneck block, first of all, what we did, what we do is basically we pass it through convolution, first convolution, which is, which is the first projection basically. So it's going to be in channels and there we're going to introduce residual channels. So it's like intermediate channels also called. So kernel size here is one, stride is one, and padding is zero. So rest channel is, so basically we, the input channel is 256, and we need to divide it by four. So it's input channels, 256 divided by four. Okay. Now we got the second convolution, which is um, three on three. And it has rest channels, so it has 64, and it's also at output 64. So it's three, three, one, one. Yeah. And we got the last layer, which is kind of like, and it got rest channels as input, so 64. And the output is basically out channels. And in most of the cases, it's input channels, but we're gonna get to the point where. We got some exceptions from it. Uh, we also need to define the ReLU and we need to write the forward function. So that's the basic. Um, later on, I'm going to build on it with exceptions. There's actually two exceptions, but first of all, we're going to take care of this. So we call it F because in the same way that it was called in a paper. So that's what extract the, the features. So identity sx uh, f is just basically residual function that it's this blocks try to approximate and h is a result of adding both of them. So we pass it through ReLU and all right, yeah. So now we can add both of them and pass through ReLU. Torch head F and X. Yeah. So that's the whole block in general, but we got two exceptions. So when we look at the paper, uh, we got the prediction we gotta do when the uh, feature maps are changing. So for example, um, we have 256 as an input, right? But in the next layer, we got 128 because we got the different feature maps. So it's a different block. So basically we need to create the projection shortcut that we discussed before. So I'm going to call it self projection and it happens when input channels are not equal to output channels. So as you remember the uh, normal block, it goes from 256 and output 256. But when we move to the higher feature maps, the actual um, input is, for example, 256, but the output is 512 and we can't add both of them. So we need to create projection to get it to 512. All right, so if self projection, now we um, create another convolutional block where we pass the, it's going to be input channels and the output channels and kernel size is going to be one and stride is going to be two. You remember because we downsample it to match the dimension of the output we can add. And also we need to introduce stride. So stride is normally one, and it's in this, it shouldn't be one. Uh, is it in convolution two? Because as you recall the bottleneck, that's where we uh, downsample input shape. Stride is also equal to two. And, and the rest channels are equal to in channels by two. Again, if self projection, 
we just pass the x to projection and we get the last exception that is the first layer so if you look at it it's basically we pass um 64 uh, feature maps to 64 block right the input of the of the bottleneck block is not 256 it's 64 but it's output 256 so we need to create again a projection to 256 from the first block that's the first block of the whole architecture so if first and you can actually copy it and we change it so yeah obviously stride is going to be one because we don't reduce the input size stride also is one here and the rest channels are divided uh, rest channels are equal to input channels because we got 64 later on and i hope it make all sense to you also the in channels won't be equal to out channels so you're gonna create the projection for the first one too all right that's it for the residual block i guess it was pretty complicated it also took me a while to actually write it so yeah we're building resnet so we inherit and then module uh, we define in it to where we pass number of blocks so this is defining how many blocks we're gonna have in the network as you can see on the image on the architecture it depends what configuration we're going to use if we have 101 layer it's, it's different configuration obviously so in our case it's a 50 layer configuration all right so input channels is equal to three and class is thousand so we predefine it we call super function all right so we start with out features so as you can see each block has an output feature that it's basically output so in the first one is 256 in the second one is 512 in the third one is 1024 and in the last one is 2048 now we create the list of residual blocks n is nl module list and we're gonna obviously define the first module straight away so the first module is the residual block in channels is 64, out channels is 256, and first is true. So that's our first block. We need to write the for loop. So for i in range land of out features. So we iterate over output features. And the next is we iterate over the number of blocks. So for in range um As you know, the first block is obviously has different input channels and out channels, and we're gonna create a projection. So how we're gonna do it is um, we already have it in the first one, which is a bit different, and then we cell blocks append the residual block. So uh, so the in channels is gonna be out features from i i minus one because we got it from the previous block and out features from i all right and here we just basically uh, append blocks with the same the same feature the same feature maps so out features from i Now we need to basically define the rest of the network, which is um, first we started with convolution, so the first conv1, and it's conv block again. Input channels is in channels, out channels is um, 64, kernel size is 7, stride is 2, and padding is 3. N next we got the max pulling. So kernel size is, I guess, it's three. Stride is two, and padding is one. All right, and what we get there is average pooling. So that's global average pooling. So it's different than regular average pooling, I guess. So in a lot of implementation, I just saw adaptive average pooling, and where we just pass 
the output size we want to have. So it's one on one. And we got the fully connected layer, the last one, and it's uh, linear. And we know the output is 2048. And the output is basically classes. Yeah, we need also ReLU. It's pretty much it. We can just do the forward function. So first we pass it through uh, convolution one. So then we pass it through max pulling and then we iterate over each block. And now we pass it through average pulling. Then we pass it through linear function. And that's basically it. Now we're going to test it if it's, I think there's going to be a bit of bugs at the start, but let's see. So nope, we pass blocks to it. And the rest now we're going to pass random variable. Okay. All right, so we get three issues. Um, the first one was, um, I actually haven't, I put X in all of them, it should be F. The next one was, we need to flatten aver after average pulling, and I haven't put return X. That's all the issue, they all fixed. The code is on GitHub if you wanna try it out, and the output that we wanted. So yeah, that's it for this video. Cheers for watching, and hopefully see you in the next one.